turn way to the mic They start dimming the lights You start feeling alright From Birmingham, home with the Teddy Longs And the Ruben Studders More once you discover For all of the lovers Whitney Houston and Roman Reigns For all of the lovers And Mickey James and Marvin Gaye For all of the lovers And Sasha Banks, Janelle Monae Silk, Sonic, and Paige Allow me to say Look, I just found a place We'd escape Every one of us I was kinda late so I just made it off the struggle bus Walking by the fate Cause I know it's right in front of us Yo, I ain't with the hate Gotta focus on what's great Ladies and gentlemen Steph Hardy is on the air Had to drop a couple bars Just to make you all aware So, sit back, relax, enjoy the show You know I go by Joe or the rest of the flow Hey y'all Welcome to this new special episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl Stephanie Hardy. So on this episode, I get to have an amazing conversation with the lovely and just multi-talented Southern Honor Wrestling commentator Gerard Bonner, and he's also a radio host too. So we get into a lot of music stuff, a lot of radio stuff, and a lot of wrestling stuff, of course. So I hope you enjoy our conversation and chill out and listen to this new episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. special guest he's someone that i actually just connected with and just met like last weekend maybe a few weekends ago um when it came to SummerSlam and so many different things involving women's wrestling talk he is a radio host he is a podcast host and he is definitely a he's also a commentator for southern honor wrestling this is gerard bonner how are you gerard I'm great, Stephanie. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, it's Thursday, just getting yeah. ready to wind down for the week and everything, but yes. still busy at the same time, but still of trying course. to press on. Absolutely. Definitely. And I'm just so happy you were able to join me here on the show. I'm so glad that you're here because <laughs> you just, you just seem, you just have a lot of inspiring energy. Like, well, thank just you. A lot that you've got going on. And I, I was just like, you know that. what? I need him on my show now. <laughs> well, thank I you. Him. I appreciate that. That means a lot. Yes, you're welcome. So I'm going to start by asking you the question that I um, ask everyone once I start my interviews. And that's, when did you fall in love with wrestling? Oh, wow. I was uh, a kid. I was very, very young. As a matter of fact, I don't know that I remember exactly when because it seems like wrestling has always been there. Um, my grandfather first introduced me to wrestling and it just was a thing. Like uh, sa- at that point, wrestling was still syndicated Saturday mornings. And so living in the Northeast, it was WWE. So that was kind of my introduction to pro wrestling as a kid. And I knew I loved it. And then when I started finding out that there was more, I was like, oh, I need to find the rest of this, you know? So, you know, I started discovering the NWA and the AWA and then all these other spaces and just kind of watching wrestling bloom. But yeah, from a kid is when I first uh, fell in love with pro wrestling. Now you say in the Northeast, like what part of the Northeast were you from? So I lived, uh, I was born and raised in a space called Monticello, New York, which is about 90 miles northwest of New York City. It's in the Catskill Mountains. And so that worked out really well for WWE, headquartered, of course, in Stamford. But with all of the things that they had going on in New York City, um, it made WWE the most accessible product uh, to us at the time. Uh, interestingly enough, where I grew up, there was a network called the MSG Network, which was the Madison Square Garden Network. So back then, they would show uh, when they would have a wrestling card in the garden, which would be almost once a month. At some point, it would end up on MSG. So we'd end up getting to watch that uh, as well, which was just like one of the cool perks of living in that area. So, yeah, Northeast would be uh, the state of New York because people remind me it's not New York City. And no, it's not. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, shout out to New York. I actually yes. had the privilege of visiting um, New York City, specifically Brooklyn, in June okay. for Black WrestleFest. Yes. And that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. New York City is an entire vibe all by itself. So, yeah. Yes, it's huge. And it even is. when you think you you can visit like one part, it's it's way bigger than you think it is. Oh, and yeah. it's just like, whoa. <laughs> you can't do it in a day. It's impossible. It yeah, impossible. you can't do it in a weekend. Like, nope. I'm going to have to make multiple visits. I, I know yeah. this. I know this Absolutely. now. That's right. But when I was there, it was great. And everyone was welcoming. And it was yeah. it was amazing. So I love yeah. the parts of New York I was able to go to. I saw Brooklyn, saw some of the apartments and everything from a lot of yeah. the Spike Lee films. Uh, I yes. saw, went to um, Times Square and stuff. I actually walked up to Marcy Avenue where Jay-Z's from. Yeah. Like, so I know there's still more, but what I did see, I really love. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a, for, for any creative, New York City is the spot. Like, I love to go there just to recharge my creative energies. Hang out in Times Square. For me, I got to walk by Madison Square Garden. Like, it's it's the holy hush. Like, it is just, it is the place. So, yeah, New York City is, it's a, it's a vibe all by itself. I love it. Yeah, I feel like if I went to MSG, I would cry. <laughs> oh, let me I tell you, it, it it is literally one of those things where you walk up on it and it's like, <gasps> it's, it's really one of those things. And so you start thinking about the history of it. And so funny story, I actually got a chance to, and so this is cool. So my honeymoon, we went for a uh, cruise and then we ended up back in New York City. And in New York City, my wife was kind enough to allow me, I have to say it that way, uh, to, <laughs> to let me do a special tour of Madison Square Garden. Trust me when I tell you, you need a VIP tour of Madison Square Garden in your life. They show you like everything. So they still have like the boots from Roddy Piper and Hulk Hogan from WrestleMania one. Like I'm losing it watching all this. It's crazy. It's crazy. So VIP tour Madison Square Garden must do. Okay. I'm going to consider yeah. it next time. Yes. Like seriously. Yeah. So when did you decide or when did you start feeling like you could use your voice um when it came to wrestling or even when it came to like your radio career like when did you decide that, that was what you wanted to do with your life so as a kid i found myself intrigued by radio um we had a station uh called wsul in monticello it was a small radio station they did primarily pop music and um i was just always so intrigued i was so intrigued that in the sixth or seventh grade, I think it was sixth grade, um, they actually would have the, the people who would do the announcements on the PA system. And so I was the guy that tried out for that and got it at sixth grade. Now in middle school, you were only supposed to do that in seventh or eighth, but I'm doing it in sixth. And so it was just, I was always intrigued by the behind the scenes piece, the power of the voice, that type of thing. So I was always involved in things like that. And um, yeah, as time continued to progress, you know, just realizing what your voice could do, being involved in music and all that type of jazz. Um, but then I ended up getting involved in radio. Um, gosh, man, several years later after college. And that really kind of led to the whole trajectory of, wow, you could really do all of this in terms of what you do with the voice. Now, the funny part is, as a kid, I had um, wrestling figures and all that type of thing. So I'm making wrestling matches and I'm commentating the wrestling matches as a kid. Like, just it's just what you do, right? So I did not know how much that would ultimately help me uh, growing up in this line of work at this point. But yeah, all the way back in sixth grade, I knew I loved using my voice um, from announcements to radio and all of that stuff, yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's, that's kind of how it starts a little bit. Sometimes it really does start for people, you know, when they're really young. Right. Um, for me, it didn't start when I was really young. Okay. Um, mine, mine started only two years ago, but either way. Gotcha. Um, but somehow or another, I feel like my life has prepared me in a sense because, of course, some of the stuff that I was made to do or taught yeah. to do 
naturally because my mom wanted me to sound like I had some sense. My right. grandma set me up for speeches at church. Yes. So either way, and then of course you have school. So either right. way, you feel like you it their life sort of prepares you for what you're meant to do in a sense. It does. It even does. even when you don't know. Right. Right. No, I, I totally agree. Know. Because I, I didn't know uh, at the time, you know, that I'd be doing radio, that I'd be doing pro wrestling. I, I didn't know any of that. It was mm -hmm. just, I like this. But you're right. Our, you know, our parents, our forefathers, they tend to set us up in spaces uh, so that we can actually have those things used and we can get accustomed to it. And so then when you step in these spaces, you go, oh, yeah, I, I have done that before. That does transfer over. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Definitely. So it seems like you started your radio career very early and then you sort of kept it going, you know, throughout your life. So who would you say sort of inspired you, you know, as you were going through your, your radio hosting journey? Like, did you have any examples or any, you know, DJs that, that you heard that you liked um, or you picked out any favorites as you were growing? So it's funny. Um, I talked about WSUL, which was kind of the station there in Monticello. While I was living in Monticello, there was also a station in Poughkeepsie, New York, which was about 60 miles south of that. They had the dope music like SUL had, you know, the 80s pop, which has its place, by the way. Oh, but yeah. I mean, the more urban music showed up on um you know, the station out of Poughkeepsie. And then on the good days when the signal was right, I could actually catch some stations from New York City. So we'd catch WBLS. And by then it was like, whoa, New York radio is a completely different ball of wax. So just hearing how, you know, they would introduce songs, hearing how uh, they would specialize in premiering songs, doing world premieres and all that type of stuff. So that what that did was it really gave me this uh, idea about the power of breaking songs. You know, that's what radio certainly used to do, still does sometimes, but now so now it's more Internet. But uh, radio was primarily for doing that. So that's something that I started taking with me, you know, where I, wherever I was going in terms of radio, like, OK, how can we use this platform to introduce new artists, independent artists, and the like? So that's kind of really where all that ended up starting for me. And I just kind of ran with it from there. Okay. So yeah. basically, you know, you did take learning from these stations and just sort of take it with you and, and let it run. Absolutely. Now, I know, I know for me... I love listening to radio and I still do to a certain extent, depending on my mood. Sure. And I know a lot of people, when I first started podcasting, I do pay a lot of attention to the DJs or to the personalities that are on there. Yeah. And I loved everyone like on Hot 1077. This is here in Birmingham, Alabama. Okay. Um, sweet. That's where I'm from. Yeah. So um, I love Tasha Simone. Mm -hmm. And I also loved um, Kim Moore, um, who yeah. I believe is still on 98.7 Kiss FM. Nice. And I did love Tom Joyner. Of course, he's retired Legend. Now. Legend. Yes, legendary. Had no mm -hmm. clue how legendary he was until I got a little bit older. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like he was one of my favorites as well. Mm -hmm. And um, Steve Harvey to a certain extent. But then again, you know, you kind of familiar with him just in life period. Right. Before Absolutely. you before I knew he even had a radio station. And right. then, of course, you have the Breakfast Club now. Um, yeah. More a lot of newer stuff. And For Hot sure. 97 and a lot of yeah. different radio stations. Like, and I know there's one radio station called The Wave in Los Angeles that I really love too. Mm -hmm. Um, I listened to that all throughout, you know, the time I went, I was in LA. So yeah. I love radio and I yeah. love, you know, picking out people whose voices I become attached to, you yes. know, and how they introduce, you know, songs and stuff like that. So I love radio and yeah. the personality. And I sort of just started taking a little bit from what I learned from them. From mm -hmm. listening to them all these years. Oh, and Michael Baseman. I love me yeah. Michael Baseman. He's really good. He's so He's good. So good. I'm like, oh. oh. I, I remember I would listen to him at work and the way he would tee up conversations. And it, you know, of course, when you're listening to urban radio, urban radio likes more music than conversation, unless you get the right topics. You get the right topics, we can listen all day. Bazin was brilliant in getting the right topics teeing them up 
making us interested. Like it was, oh gosh, yeah, I, I love him. Love him. Yeah, I miss him so much. Like yeah. me and my mama, and then my sister later on would listen to him in the afternoon. We come from school, yeah. and he would just be so popping. Like when it comes to any of the subjects, like, and then it would make us to go to talking in the car. And they actually met him at an event at a um, Hot nice. One Hundred Seven Seven event when nice. he had his own um, radio show. Yeah, um, like that was so cool for them. I didn't get a chance because I had stuff to do because I was in high school at the time. For sure, but for sure. You know, they were so lucky to have met him and he was and he was like somebody that inspired me too. Yeah. So it's just I just love all of those people, like when it comes to radio and even now to a degree. Yeah. Um but yeah, I totally respect that. So when you mention wow, <laughs> I'm just so excited right now. Oh, awesome. Um so you started so according to your instagram it says mm -hmm. that you sort of started your radio career a little bit like around 2004. yeah that's about right professionally about right yeah yeah so so what happened was i um okay so let's backtrack let's go back to 1996 1997. Mm -hmm. uh, i'm in college and um so i was working with so remember 96 the internet was kind of just kind of starting in terms of being able to have some entertainment on there and that type of thing so i was involved with a uh website called gospelflavor.com mm -hmm. the design of this website was pretty much to provide um news entertainment information uh and faith-based music which did not exist in 1996, 97. So we did that, it was popping, it was really cool. Um, by 2004, um, some folks uh, in Virginia Beach, which is where I was at the time, uh, they were aware of the station. I met them at a concert, a live recording, and they realized who I was and they were like, we would love to have you um, come do a new segment, like a 15 minute entertainment segment on the show. I'm like, great, that'd be awesome. The first day I went to do it, people started calling in. It turned into a two hour thing. I was like, wait, how did this happen? <laughs> I'm only allowed it for 15 minutes. So that ultimately turned into me becoming a co-host uh, on the morning show there and did that for about, oh God, probably three, four years and uh, won some awards and things like that. But yeah, that's how the radio, the official professional radio career started back in 2004. Okay, so you started on a gospel website like gospelflavor.com. I have a nerdy question to ask, considering you said that was in nineteen in the nineteen nineties. Yes, I was a young child, and gospel was really the first genre I ever listened to because my parents and my grandparents only wanted me to listen to clean stuff. Of course, um, were you was hmm? How was the landscape of gospel and how did that change, of course, when Kirk Franklin came on the scene? Because that yeah. was really the first gospel artist I, you know, was exposed to, you know, as a younger person. Sure. And I know anytime I would hear stomp, even to this day, mm -hmm. I will still dance and just yes. stop everything. Yes. So how was the landscape of gospel music at that point? We're getting a little bit off topic in terms of wrestling, yeah, but I don't care. This is yeah. my show. So I, I, it um, is totally. <laughs> so how was the landscape of gospel back then when you were on gospelflavor.com and how did that change when it came to more urban contemporary gospel music? Yeah, so 96, 97, uh, boy, we could go on a whole clinic here. We start talking about <laughs> gospel. Uh, 96, 97, obviously the massive launch of Kirk Franklin and God's Property, uh, Stomp, all of that jazz. And really the 90s was a major movement for gospel music. Um, it started getting a lot of crossover appeal. Um, they also started to have a lot of mainstream labels pick up gospel divisions which was kind of unheard of prior to the 90s. So, you know, that really revolutionized what gospel music looked like. And the urban side really began to grow by leaps and bounds. Kirk Franklin was definitely a big part of it. There were a lot of other artists that were a big part. Fred Hammond and a lot of other incredible folks. Um, and it inspired a really neat movement to happen as well. So 
when Gospel Flavor came along um, as the internet portion of that, that really was, again, revolutionary because the record labels were just like, oh, snap, there's an internet outlet that's credible, that's talking about this, let's run with it. You know, so really the, the space of gospel music during that space, it was it was major. I mean, think about this. Kirk Franklin and Stomp um, was being played regularly on MTV. Wow. Like we have to process that, right? That's even today you don't hear, you know, regular gospel music of any form being played in these kinds of spaces. So Kirk is being played on MTV regularly on their countdown that song got nominated for uh an r b award for the grammys that year like it was bananas and it really just kind of opened up the realm of what gospel music could do on a mainstream platform so yeah it it ushered in a lot of new spaces for gospel in the 90s and progressively so man yeah i bet crazy to be times I bet to be an adult and witness that was just insane. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, even being and just just watching the evolution of all of it was crazy. And, you know, being watching. So it's funny because and wrestling and music and all these things are so similar because as yeah. industries change, there's always this percentage of people that embraces the change and another percentage that's like, this is the worst thing ever, right? Yes. You know, so <laughs> that that happens in wrestling and it happens in gospel and it's still happening in both. And so there was that kind of opposition happening um, in 97. And so here it is now uh, where we're looking at if we're looking at gospel music, Kirk is still like king and he's still right. doing amazing. But then you have a hip hop component now that is everywhere that's doing things that traditional gospel isn't doing. So you now have elements of Christian hip hop um, on mainstream platforms on the NBA and NBA 2K ESPN. Uh, there's a song called Coming In Hot from Andy Minio and Lecrae, which went crazy viral on the social. People using it on reels. and all. Truist, the bank just picked that up and they're using that in a commercial now. So it's, right. it's crazy just to see how all of this is evolving. But like I told you in wrestling, there is still a whole component like people who hate it and they think it's just the worst thing in the world. And yeah, so. Yeah, and then even in wrestling, Raw's old theme song was actually by a Christian artist. NF. And I didn't know that until mm -hmm. um, Josiah Williams, shout out to him because he actually did the him. theme song for yeah. the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. You know, He's the he, man. I love yeah, him. Yeah, he retweeted and said that that was a gospel rapper and i was like are you serious right. really right. like that was that was extreme to me and that song mm -hmm. was fire you know so yeah. and then before it was the raw theme song they used in a vignette for bianca belair mm -hmm. and i was just like this is perfect yeah. but i had i just i wasn't ready to find that out and when i did i was like whoa it's but pretty yeah, shocking about that, like all day <laughs> for but sure. Yeah, what would you say is the best advice that you got, you know, as you were starting your career as a radio host? Uh, wow. Um, best advice. I, I would simply say it was just being true to myself, you know, um, because the challenge in those spaces is you see other people doing things and you almost think, well, if that's how they do it, then that's how it should be done. But if it's not authentic to who you are, then you're just becoming a carbon copy of them and you'll never be successful. So I had to learn to find my voice, which was another important piece of advice that I got, um, because it's funny. I, I remember recording some of the things I did in early days, and then I'll go back on occasion and play it and go, eek, like <laughs> it's horrible. But it takes time to find your voice, you know, when you find your voice, become comfortable with your style. And it, again, it's it's about being yourself. And so that ended up proving to be helpful for me because when you're authentically you, there's always going to be an audience that appreciates it. Definitely. And that's really good advice for anybody in anything, really. Yes. Like not even just not even just in podcasting or in radio, but just in life, period. Right. Like absolutely. You know, I I believe it was I just read this quote on a Facebook status from last year. It was Mr. Black from the Jobber Tears podcast. Shout out to them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. He said, you know, when you're dope in real life, you know, you'll be dope in everything else. And I was just like, and when I reread that, I was like, dang, that's a yeah. bar. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. That is a major bar. And yeah. I just, and that, you know, applies to everything and everybody. So, you know, for those watching, just be true to yourself and, Absolutely. you know, there'll be room for that. Yeah. So, when did you decide to make the transition from radio into wrestling commentary? And was it hard or was it easy? So, the doors for wrestling commentary opened up in 2019. Mm -hmm. And, um, in terms of whether it was easy or hard, uh, I don't know that it was hard. Um, I'll go so far as to say, well, let me back up. I have to tell you the story of how it happened. Okay. Because the how it happened is where, so I've always been trying to figure out how to get into commentary and into the wrestling business, but never really knew how. And, you know, there really aren't, there aren't just like job openings, right? That you can find <laughs> on Indeed for this. So it's really about, you know, ended up in the right place at the right time. So um, ironically, I ended up getting for my birthday a uh, a 10 Groupon, a Groupon of, of 10 passes to DDPY, which is uh, Diamond Dallas Page's Yoga Performance Center here in Atlanta. So mm -hmm. I went um, top of 2019. And as I was going, you know, I, I loved it. It was great. But I started seeing on the wall um, the sign or the logo for AEW. And I'm like, huh? What is that doing here? Now, this is like the launch of AEW. What is that doing there? So I ended up finding out that DDPY was actually the space where they were shooting vignettes and they were shooting promos for AEW. Crazy. Well, it got crazier because then I found out that they were running a wrestling promotion um, out of DDPY, the folks that were there were running it was called Southern Honor. So I was like, cool, they're running these shows once a month. And so I finally ended up at a show in September. Um, so in November's show of 2019, I meet the commentators. The problem was one of them didn't show. So mm -hmm. I said to the other commentator that was there, I was like, listen, if you ever need any help or whatever, I'd be more than happy. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about me. I'm normally not that guy. I am not the guy to just run up to wow. somebody and say, hey, these are my services. Let me help you. But it was just kind of, you know, what I call five seconds of courage, right? You need five seconds of courage to make a decision. That's all you need. Once you do it, then you can just grab another five seconds from somewhere else. So I went on. I, I told him that. And I figured... He's not paying attention. You know, good, good, good convention talk. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm like, all right, fine. The next month, I get ready to go to the show. I had a really crazy day that day. Got to the show. 30 minutes before the show, I walk in, and the booker is meeting me at the door, and he's like, we've been trying to contact you all day. I was like, wait, what are you talking about? Apparently, they had been trying to DM me. I hadn't been on the social, so I didn't know. And this is the next thing he says to me. He says, do you want to call the show tonight? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So again, five seconds of courage. I said, yeah, that fast. And then I thought about it. Like, what did I just say? Like, I'm not even sure what the matches are tonight. Like, how am I going to do this? Are you, but I already said, yes, I can't back out at this point. Right. So I, I get in and um, about 15 minutes before the show, they sit me down at the commentary booth. The owner comes over and he says, uh, hey, if you do a good job tonight, the job is yours. So don't suck. Jeez, no pressure, right? Right. And so, and so we get started, and I promise you, it felt like breathing. I couldn't believe just how things were flowing. And after the first match, my fellow commentator, Brandon, he was, I said, so how is it? He's like, oh, we got something. Yeah. And they offered me the job that night. So I say all of that to say, in terms of the transition between the two, I feel like everything prepared me for that. So it was not nearly as hard as I thought it would be just because I was more prepared than I realized I was. Um, so I had a period where I said, well, maybe I should just stop radio for a bit um, and fully focus on wrestling. Uh, but it didn't exactly happen that way. So I'm actually still doing both. 
uh, which is pretty cool. But for me, pro wrestling, being able to do this, it is legitimately, of all the things that I do, it is the thing that I think is the easiest for me to do. And that actually scares me. Mm. It, it scares, scares you. It scares me because I obviously I'm preparing for everything. When I do commentary, I get prepared, all this type of stuff. But I've never had something come this easy to me in terms of my ability to do it. And so that is not a braggadocious statement. It just scares me because I'm used to having to do all of this preparation and then talk myself up. And No, it's just like, let's go. Let's go. So I'm grateful. So in terms of the transition, not a hard transition at all, because I realized, like I was saying earlier, all of these previous things prepared me for this moment. Yeah, see, for me in commentary, like, it wasn't so easy for me because okay. I hadn't done it before at that point sure. either. Yeah, And I had only been doing podcasting and hosting. Gotcha. And I was just like, okay, I don't like, but the opportunity for me came through Miranda Morales, who's out in Arizona okay. nice. and she's a podcast host and she was friends on Facebook with Casey Dillon, who okay. was starting a female wrestling promotion, the Belladonna division in Gaston, Alabama, which no. is about two or three hours away from me. Okay. And I was just like, and she basically, you know, DM'd me the information. And I was just like, Cause she was looking for somebody and nobody else had responded to her. And I was like, wow. maybe I should try, you know, just yeah. to see. And so I told Casey who I was, messaged her, gave her all my, you know, credentials at that point. And yeah. she said, you know, send me like an episode of your podcast. And I sent her like my trailer, which okay. is only about maybe 40 seconds and then another episode. Yeah. And she listened to the trailer and she wanted me immediately. And I was just like, what? Wow. Excuse me? Yeah. And ever since then, I only had a couple weeks to practice, mm -hmm. but I practiced and listened to every person I had ever listened to when it came to commentary. Yes. Michael Cole, everybody. Like, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> everybody. And just practiced, you know, as I watched matches that they have on YouTube Absolutely. and just practice and practice and practice. And then once I got started, it feels easier once I practice. Like I'm not one of those people that can just do it like yeah. off the cuff or offhand. Like I have to have all my information first for sure. and then, and then I have to be prepared for it and be, you know, and I'm naturally energized anyway. Yeah. Um, cause, and I just love to talk anyway, yeah. but so that wasn't a problem. It's just for me, I have to have all the information first and I do color. So okay. it's yeah. kind of like, cause I'm not really good at play by play, but okay. I love color. Yeah. And so doing that, it was just really fun. Like it wasn't as easy for me, but at the same time, I do still enjoy it. So yeah. I'm still finding my way. Absolutely. I feel like a baby learning well, how to walk. <laughs> it, well, no, I get it. And almost like anything, you know, the more that you do it, the easier it becomes. But the studying piece becomes important, you know, because I started paying attention, a lot more attention to you know what commentators were doing what they were saying and then for me i just remembered like i've been paying attention to commentary for a really long time you know yeah. that was one of the parts of wrestling that attracted me was hearing how they would describe things and hearing the humor and hearing you know how they'd connect to pop culture and those types of things and i was like yes that yeah that that's what i like yeah that's my favorite part is connecting mm -hmm. pop culture because i I sort of absorb everything. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like I absorb everything to an almost scary degree sometimes, but <laughs> it helps though. It, it helps does. because when because when don't nobody know what's going on, you can tell them. So that part. That it, part. it works. I remember one time I made a frozen reference while I was commenting. Nice. It nice. Was, it was the coolest thing ever. Like yeah. I got to yeah. let it go like that. <laughs> like that that just blessed my life. I was just like, yes. yes. Yeah, <laughs> because I love Disney movies, so Absolutely. I was just like, you know what? To use that, it it just meant the world to me. I was like, yes, this is my thing. That is so. Cool. Um, I noticed that you have a whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dropping things. Um, so I noticed that you have a really deep love um for faith based music. So is yeah. that sort of? 
is that something that you wanted to pursue? Like, can you sing? Or is that something that you just decided that you want to just talk about, you know, in terms of being just a radio host with that? So it's interesting. Um, grew up a church kid, uh, like almost all of us, right? Uh, yeah. Grew up a church kid. And <laughs> um, my mom, actually, music runs kind of deep in my family. My mother was an organist my grandmother was a piano player my mm -hmm. dad had like the most amazing record collection like you could ever imagine so music you know surrounded me in a lot of ways and um growing up as a kid you know i i loved music really of all forms but um you know much like you were mentioning how our parents wanted us to listen to clean music you know my parents inundated me with gospel music and so um, that was cool. And obviously I snuck other things in. That's just what we do, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so it, <laughs> it's what we do. And I'm wearing a Prince shirt. So, yes. you know, like we, we, for me, it's funny. I love faith-based music. I love all forms of music as well, but it's just interesting for, uh, for some really cool reason, I've been given the opportunity to be able to have a voice um, in the spaces of faith-based music. And so um, I bring all of who I am to it, you know? So it's not a space where we solely talk about that. I like to really look at its relevance to the rest of the music field. So, you know, I do talk about that on the socials. I talk about a bunch of things. Um, but yeah, over time, I think people have, uh, for whatever reason, come to find me as a trusted voice in that space. Um, because for me, I want to see people in that space find success. Um, you know, I think it is one of those genres that uh, certainly has a quality message to it, but it's, it's been challenged in terms of how it presents the message and then its relevance in mainstream contexts. So, you know, for me, it's like, okay, well, how do you take something that is that solid and use these other spaces to actually allow people to know it's there, you know? Mm -hmm. So I try to use uh, things in that regard. Now, fortunately for me, I'm involved in other spaces in terms of music as well. So uh, it does give me opportunity to talk to other folks and connect with other people and things like that. But I think as a church kid, I've always got a soft spot for the faith-based community and wanting to see it find a degree of success. Definitely. Like, I yeah. totally feel that. It's yeah. so funny you talked about, you know, sneaking and listening to music. I yeah. really didn't do that. Like, it took me a long time to really listen to anything besides sacred music. Like, a long sure. time. I like, I really didn't get into it until I was watching American Idol. Oh, wow. And I know okay. that's real late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's how it started. Like, yeah. it was really late for me like that. And then yeah. that's when I started actually exploring a whole lot more. And when my parents actually started opening up a little bit more to other forms of music, it was right. like gospel, dancing music, then R&B, yeah, and yeah. then everything else. Right. So, you know, like it, it took a while for me to really like open up two other types of music it took sure. me a while to open up to prince too because ironically mm -hmm. enough my dad is the biggest prince fan wow like, he really is like he has yeah. all of his albums yeah. um in vinyl form had them in cassette form had them yeah. in cd form like it was it's like that's his whole that's almost like a big part of his personality it's that he loves prince. That. I, I love, love Prince too, though, because yeah, yeah. listening to him on my own, it was just like, he's just so talented and just so varied in his music. Yes. He's so yes. varied. And it's just like, man, like all of this stuff that you were talking about is just so, it's still very relevant even now. Totally. And just, and then just how he opened up um, doors for it, for multiple multiple people and multiple instrumentalists too and live yes. bands and yes. everything yes. like he he was just the consummate artist to me so totally no i totally I agree love. with that totally and agree with that yeah i have a pair of print shorts too oh impressive yeah. from impressive. walmart <laughs> hey, listen we get this stuff where we can find it so i'm all yes. for it I'm it was on it. sale i was so glad yeah yeah so dope. your shirt would go perfect with them too so excellent yes i need i need other print shirts though because i see a lot of purple rain shirts yeah and i need other albums because 
I just need other album t-shirts yeah. cuz musicology yeah. is my favorite one. So. Oh, okay. Dope. Yeah. Dope. Very yeah, his, very his catalog is, <laughs> But but his catalog is so crazy and I think, you know, we we probably didn't appreciate Prince the way we should have and I think, you know, in his passing, a lot of us kind of started to open our eyes to oh my gosh, like he was incredible, you know, and even finding out what some of the songs meant afterwards was like, oh, that's what that meant. It's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. So yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. So how do you feel about radio having a place during the musical, during the digital musical age? Because I'm finding, you know, the more we get off into streaming, it's almost like the less people tend to value radio a lot of the time. Like now, like even when you make cars, it's like they put the radio in there, but then they also give you more of the option to like plug in your phone and listen sure. to like streaming services and stuff like that. Yeah. So how do you feel radio still has a place in society, even as we're sort of moving away from it and people sort of question, you know, where, like what the point is of it? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. There are some stats that proved, and I think this report came out about two years ago, that still 95% of people get their information uh, musically and otherwise still from radio, uh, terrestrial radio, which is interesting. So radio itself, I think, has evolved in many spaces. So, um, you know, one of the things I was able to do uh, was I have I have an internet radio station and internet radio in itself is one of those spaces that started challenging what terrestrial radio looked like to the point where now terrestrial radio if you're a station worth its salt you have a website and you're streaming digitally right. because you realize the the expansion of your audience in that regard um I think radio will always be relevant as long as they continue to be um, cognizant of how they get their content to people. That's the way that it goes. So for all that um, streaming services do, and they do a lot, and for all that social media does, I think that radio has to be um, connected enough to still provide relevance to people. So they have to still be able to provide news, provide information, provide exclusives um, that you might not be able to get solely on streaming services. So radio itself, if it stands in a space of being able to inform um, and tell people, hey, here's what's coming out. Here's what you can look forward to. Um, that's a thing. The other thing where radio has a chance to win where streaming services may not is radio still provides a space for conversation for uh, consumers. So you can't call up your streaming service and have a conversation about Angela Yee leaving the breakfast club, right? You no. can't do that, but you can do that on your lo local radio station. You know what I mean? I mean, so that, that is, which that's a piece of news in and of itself, right? Who but, Jesus. <laughs> and a big piece of news, right? So, no, 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 no. But it's just that, right? Radio has a space, if they use their space well, where they still have a voice in the community. And they still allow... Because here's the thing. Average people, everyday people, love the idea of hearing their voice in mass media. So if you can call a radio station and have your comment play, or you can, you know, call there and win a contest to get tickets to a concert, like, that's a big deal. Yes. That has never died. That excitement no. has never died. And so I think as long as radio continues to main, remain relevant in terms of how they present their content to people, we'll always be talking about radio in one form or another. Yes, it's so funny you brought up winning stuff on the radio. That happened to me last year. I won tickets to the Magic City Classic. That's like the ah, biggest HBCU game here. Yes, and I was yes. that way. And then what else happened? And I've called called in successfully on the Breakfast Club at least ten times. Oh wow, that's impressive. within the past two years. Wow. And I love listening to myself. Like it, like it's it's something that used to scare me, but mm -hmm. now it's just like anytime I try to do, it, it's almost like a sport like like yeah. depending on what subject they're talking about yeah. you know i just be like you know i'm gonna call in i'm gonna try <laughs> and it's hard to though because right. it's so many folks you know at mm -hmm. a time listening to them all over the country and i get it 
but I still be trying. And when I do get, I ooh, I be so excited. And yes. they be so nice to you and everything. And they be listening to you, whatever. And it and it is so cool when you go back and listen to yourself. You know, when mm-hmm. they post a clip on YouTube, right? It is the coolest thing ever. Absolutely. I love it so it's much. Awesome. I wish, I wish they could give me a job, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. Hey, there's an opening. So, you know, there's an opening. I might, I might be too much for them. I don't know. Oh, um, <laughs> no, I, I think they can handle it. They can handle it. They do with Charlemagne. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. But to bring the conversation back to um, wrestling a bit, mm-hmm. who would you say is your favorite wrestler of all time and why? Or do you have a top five? And it could be male, female, or non-binary. Mm, 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 mm. This is a fun question. So, Shawn Michaels definitely is very high on my list. Very, very high on my list. Um, just looking at his complete body of work uh, is really incredible. And after he had that injury to be out for five years and to come back and literally wrestle the best matches of his life... Right. That's like, oh gosh, he is he is very, very special. Um, so Shawn Michaels definitely a favorite. I'm a huge fan of AJ Styles. Um, again, I love a great technical wrestler who can just kind of mix it up and do all the things that he does. Um, he's fantastic. Now it's interesting because I almost compartmentalize certain things when it comes to wrestling uh, in terms of my favorites. So I love them. Um, Lately, I've really been paying attention to the impact of the African-American wrestler um, in this sport for obvious reasons. And so, you know, I look at my Lord. um, I can go all the way back to Rocky Johnson and Tony Atlas in terms of what they did um, in breaking that barrier in winning uh, the tag titles. Um, Obviously, Ron Simmons for all that he has represented uh, in our business. We have to talk about The Rock. I mean, The Rock is one of one, you know, um, his ability to uh, come into an industry, to talk and to then be bigger outside of the wrestling industry than he was inside of the wrestling industry. Ridiculous, insane. It's crazy. Uh, I'm a big fan of of Daniel Bryan, um, Bryan Danielson. Like I just, Love his work. Um, Had a chance to be there for WrestleMania 30 uh, when he won the title. And that was just, that whole moment was a vibe. Like, it was crazy. It was crazy. So those are some of the folks that I like um, in terms of women's women's wrestling. Uh, Definitely a fan of Bianca Belair and what she has been doing. Uh, It has been incredible to, I mean, like, incredible to watch. Um, I think a name that doesn't get talked about enough is Jazz. Um, I think what she did and what she has meant to the business, not just for African-American wrestling, but for women's wrestling in general, um, thinking about what she was doing, man, against Trish and in, and in these WrestleManias and in ECW and all of these places, like she's a legend. And then if we're going to talk legends, we have to talk about Miss Jacqueline. I mean, yeah. Jacqueline was beating men. And beating yeah. them handily. You know what I mean? So, like, I love being able to to think about the impact of what all of those amazing uh, athletes have done for this business. So, yeah, those are some of my favorites. That's a pretty solid list of favorites right there. Men and women, definitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I find that asking for top fives is pretty hard or at least it's hard for me to answer because it changes so for me i can only name like my number ones so my male favorite is the rock um fair enough because coming up you know he was just the guy for me like he was just everything to me and still is to this day Mm -hmm. i will never call him dwayne dwayne johnson he's the rock no forever forever Forever. Mm -hmm. yeah and my female favorite is sasha banks yeah yeah because yeah, yeah. I just I just admire everything about her in terms of how she sort of goes in and just seeks to learn newer ways, you know, to yeah. amplify her game, to challenge anybody she's in the ring with. Mm-hmm. And I feel like she's just never had a bad match against anybody. I and agree. it's just like 
she's just the greatest the greatest woman's wrestler ever to me i love it and love i'll it. fight i'll fight you <laughs> like i don't care like i will fight anybody on that but she's yeah. but nobody has wanted to fight with me about that yet but i'll yeah. fight you over her, her catalog is serious it's serious. It's so serious and then yeah. for her to be as young as she is right you know that inspires me too it's just like girl like do you know who you are do you know what you've yeah. done like right right it's insane it like is. i used her match against bailey at nc takeover brooklyn in um a presentation when i was in college for wow. a, a communications class yeah so it's it's serious for me like i oh and then that I watch her, special. and then I watch her and Bianca's match for clear skin. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just, just to feel like I can do something because watching that match just that's like the wind underneath my wings in yeah. this business. It just makes me feel like I can do anything now. Absolutely, absolutely. Anything like, oh, I love them both so much. I love so, that. what are your hobbies outside of commentary and outside of hosting? Oh, hobbies, hobbies. Well, I am a musician, um, and so I play quite a bit. Um, I love to teach music. Uh, I am a math major, which is a shocker to a lot of people, but I'm a math major, and so that just that means I can... Yeah, it just means I can critically think. So I, I love I love being able to do that. I like to exercise. Uh, I, I have some random games that I like to play. Uh, I love words. So you can catch me words with friends, Wordle. Um, love that. Like do that every day. Um, that's just kind of a thing for me. And then I have a, a naturally a wrestling game that I like to play WWE champions. And so, yeah, those are the kind of the, the sometimes mindless, but fun things that I get to do. Um, obviously, uh, I'm trying to think what am I binge watching these days uh geez, it's been a minute since i've done some binge watching but a good friend of mine um put me on to some anime oh. and so i just started watching that oh gosh i'm trying to remember the show they put me on it was something about a classroom it's on hulu and pretty oh, interesting wow. stuff interesting stuff so is it my hero academia uh is that the name of it it's got to do I with the classroom know. and they're trying to they're trying to kill this teacher, but the teacher will never die. And it's really quite intriguing. It sounds violent, but it's not nearly as violent as it sounds. But uh, see, see, gosh, I, I got to find the name of that show now. See, I can't even tell you tell you exactly what it is. But when you said classroom, I just thought about My Hero Academia. But yeah. I really don't watch anime like that. My boyfriend does. So he's okay. a connoisseur yeah. of anime. And it was but, my introduction to anime. So, like, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm going to find the name of this, though. When I find yes. it, I'll be like, yeah. I understand. It is called... Oh, no. Wrong thing. Wrong thing. Go ahead. I'm going to find it. I'm going to find no, it. No, you're don't... good. <laughs> <sighs> it's anime. Oh. Go figure. But, yeah, that's one of the new things I've been getting into. And so... But, yeah, you can... You'll find me just... Uh, liking word games and things of that nature. I just like to tease my brain and things like that. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, do you feel like you found your groove in commentary with your partner? Um, and when did you realize you found your groove as a commentator? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think... I think definitely I'm finding the groove. Um, certainly working with Brandon in Southern Honor is has really been amazing. We never really talked about who was going to do what. It just kind of certain things just kind of fell into place. So it kind of fell into place that he would be doing play by play. And it fell into place that I'm doing color. And a lot of that had to do with I love to tell stories. So I love telling stories. I love talking stats um, and really building a case. I guess that's where my math thing comes in right so i love building a case for that so when did i i feel like we found our groove um i feel like we found it probably after we came because we had a break uh at the start of the pandemic um which was kind of wild because it was like okay i just was kind of really getting into things and like three four months in now the pandemic hits but we came back in august of 2020 
and we just never stopped. And so I felt like we really started to get our groove by the end of that year where we really started feeling super solid. Um, though I think our chemistry was from day one. Um, what's really interesting is as we started doing more things, that's when I think it really got tested for me because Southern Honor is a product that we knew like the back of our hands. So if it was preparing, it would be preparing if new people were coming in. But then um, one of our first tests was doing some work with the Nightmare Factory where we were literally walking in cold. And it wow. was like, these are brand new people who didn't even have names for their moves. And there was no storyline to talk about. And so it's like, what do you do with this? And so that was probably the most nervous I ever was. Um, but that really helped me to figure out, okay, if I can call with no story attached, uh, then I think we'll be okay. So we were filming some things for that. I don't know if that'll ever see the light of day. I'm not sure. But all of those things um, opened up some doors. So when I got to Battle Slam, I feel even more comfortable working with Suge, um, Suge D. And so, again, it's two different kinds of chemistry between Suge and Brandon. But we're able to tell different stories. And I really enjoy that. So for me, it then became a question of, could I do commentary without Brandon? Because mm. Brandon and I have been a team that's been so, so thick that when Battle Slam showed up, it was so that's when I got nervous because it was like, OK, will I have this same kind of chemistry with someone else? You know, will we be able to still kind of do because like with Brandon and I, we don't ever talk about what we're going to do. We just do it, you know, so it was like. Can I have that same kind of chemistry with a different broadcast partner? And thankfully, uh, Suge is amazing and we do. So I think I started to feel like, oh, OK, I think I can really do all of this now, because if I can do it with a different partner, then I take out the excuse that it's only just Brandon. Right. And if right. I do it at uh, if I do it at Nightmare Factory where we have no storylines, OK, well, then I can take out the excuse that, oh, it's just because I know the product. So now I think I can start feeling confident in any of these spaces that, nah, we can do it. If it's a different partner, different product, what have you, yeah. Yeah, like it does feel good when you're able to sort of branch out and do it in other places with other yeah. people. Like yeah. it, it, ma it made me feel super good when I was actually able to commentate um, at Battle Club Pros, Welcome to War for Big Swole and- um, Wow. For Big Swole and Jordan Blade, That's like- dope. I was brought on as guest commentary like the day before. Shout out to Joe okay. Morales. Yeah. And he just asked me and I was just like, okay, sure. Yeah. And because I couldn't say no to him because I was just like, right. you know, everybody had been so welcoming and, to me and everything. Yeah. And so, you know, I got all the information together, you know, talked to Swole, talked to, you know, Jordan. And yeah. once I did everything, you know, it got all the information I was freaking out because he told me I had an entrance to make. And I was just like, what? <laughs> I've never done an entrance before in my life. But wow. I watched everybody else do it. So I was like, okay, fine. Yeah. So I did it. And then once I finally sat down and got to commentating, it felt really good. And I good. feel like now, since I've done it, you know, with Joachim, and since I've done it in New York, that means I can do anything. So, absolutely absolutely like, that just made me feel like i could do this and the fact that i got to commentate for big swole who's just so respected That's and awesome. someone who i've admired since the may young classic like yes that meant yes. the world to me i was just like oh here we go this is yeah. great oh yeah. god it was just congratulations crazy. That's awesome That's thank awesome. thank you thank you so much yeah. uh still feel like a baby though but it's okay no, <laughs> but you've had some great experiences that's really really good stuff yeah, and I even got to commentate for Jazz as well, like during her wow. farewell tour. Yeah. Like she, like it was a, I believe it was like a, it was a tag team match, and it was no DQ, and it was extreme. Okay. And she started grabbing chairs and and hitting people, and she and her tag team partner was the Wode. And yes. Yes. I love, like, I love them so much. Like, I've wow. had her on the pod. I've had the world on the pod. Yeah. And just watching them, you know, go at it was just really cool. And there was a point where my commentary bestie had to hand one of them a chair. And everything oh, wow. started moving so fast. And I actually had to commentate by myself. Yeah. And that was my first time. And I was like, okay, here we go. Right. Right. You know, like, you just got to go home. Yeah. 
awesome. That is so good. Oh man, it, it was great. It was fun. Yeah. And just the experiences that I have had have been great. And I'm pretty sure yeah. you've had great experiences too. You said you commentated for Battle Slam. What was it yes. like commentating for Lil Scrappy? Yeah. So what was wow. that like? Because finding out that he was a wrestler surprised me. I was like, wait, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. was that like? You know, it, it was it was incredible. It was really, really incredible. Um, I know that that's supposed to hit Fight TV one of these days very, very soon. Um, but, you know, even the whole Battle Slam experience was crazy because it was another one of those things that literally just happened. The day before the first Battle Slam, I get a call that says, hey, whoever was supposed to do commentary can't make it. Can you do it? And I was like, sure. I was already planning to go to the show. Um, and so what was interesting was... What initially intimidated me was, um, obviously, I had a different partner in in Shook D that I was working with. But then, like, the caliber of the folks that were on this card, I mean, you had people from AEW, you had people from Impact, you had people from Ring of Honor. And in my head, I'm like, okay, this is pretty major. Like, you got to crush this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you have to. You know, um, and so Battle Slam is a vibe. Like, it is a vibe. You got a live DJ that's there who's literally playing a bunch of music. It's like a big party, you know? And so I think there's a different kind of approach and freedom that you have with Battle Slam, knowing that it's going to be very heavily hip hop influenced. So for me, it's wanting to make sure that, okay, the things that I'm talking about will really appeal to this specific audience versus something that is a, of a different population that you think to yourself, okay, what references can I use? So I know I can easily use a ton of musical references over in Battle Slam, which is really dope. Um, so when it got to the little scrappy piece, man, like, so when we, when he was there to perform the previous month, that was awesome. And then, you know, literally I'm sitting there on commentary quiet while he's getting ready to perform. Baron Black interferes. And then all of a sudden there's physical confrontation. And I'm like, wait, what? You know, <laughs> so it, even in that moment, it didn't dawn on me that there would ultimately be a match. And so when I heard there was going to be a match, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, this is really going to happen. So I... I found myself very, very grateful. So I'll tell you guys something um, that I guess most people won't know, but ultimately will find out um, without giving too much away. So he has his match. The match was crazy. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Like it, let me say this. I can, I can definitely say this. One of the things that I think is so cool about what's happening with celebrities entering pro wrestling is that they are taking it seriously. Like, it is not just, hey, I'm going to have a wrestling match and, you know, whatever happens, happens. No, they are taking it seriously. They are training. They're doing. So I was very, very surprised by what Little Scrappy brought to this match. And when you see it, you're going to be like, what? <laughs> it was it was it was really, really good. So there was a match that happened after this. So the match is happening. And then from the back, little Scrappy comes out and he decides to hop on commentary. Whoa. So, yeah. So it's me, Suge, and little Scrappy on commentary. And I'm standing there like, this is really happening right now. Okay. And then, like, all these people gathering around us trying to get pictures and videos. And I'm like, this is happening now. And... Yes, it was a very surreal moment. I can't wait for you guys to see it. But yeah, it's one of those things where you, you're you in it. You're like, don't screw it up. But you're trying to pinch yourself while you're in it. And you're like, yeah. So it's still taking me time to process that that actually happened. That yeah. sounds amazing. I cannot. Yeah. I love that for you. I can't Thank wait you. to experience that um, and watch it. Like, that just sounds amazing. So yeah. I want to ask you... Um, I found out who you were through, um, women's wrestling talk, which is something yes. that we both work on together Yes, Shout um, out TK. through TK Trinidad, yes. um, with WWT live. Now yes. I'm not on that show, but I do watch it from time to time, anytime I can. Okay. So how did you two link up and 
what inspired you to come on for that show? Sure. Uh, so TK and I uh, met probably a year or so ago. Um, we followed each other on the socials. She had asked me to she was at that time she was doing like some instagram lives on like thursdays or whatever and so she'd asked me on occasion to come on and um do some stuff with her and so we did earlier this year she had a panel discussion on the state of black wrestling in february and mm -hmm. she asked me to be a part of that um along with some other really cool people and so i was on for that and we stayed in touch and then when she had this idea about wwt live she you know, looped me in for it and uh, along with some other amazing people. And so that's that's how that happened. And um, it's it's amazing. TK is an incredible visionary. I am I am just super honored to be connected to uh, to what she's doing. And for me, it's it's always a reminder that, you know, you take every opportunity seriously, you know, and you treat it like it's WrestleMania, like you give yes. your absolute all to it. Because to me, everything that we do is an audition for the next thing. You know, right. you never know who's paying attention. You never know, you know, how that will lead to something else. You know, our work at Southern Honor led to being able to do some stuff at the Nightmare Factory. And Nightmare Factory led to Battle Slam. And that's just, it's all continuing to connect to each other. So, um, yeah, shout out to TK for, you know, connecting and seeing something to keep bringing me back to stuff. So I appreciate it for sure. Yeah, definitely. Like I remember just going out for because they do they posted it and was like, We're looking for people and we're looking for hosts. And I was yeah. like, Should I try this now? Because I'm still, you know, finding my way with my own sure. show. But yeah. should I try this now? And I had seen and was watching TK on After Buzz television, like before I graduated mm -hmm. college. Wow. You know, when they would talk about wrestling. And when I couldn't watch it, like that's when yeah. I, you know, found out who she was. Wow. Um, and I was just like, well, why not? And so yeah. I just did. And I'm so glad I did because she, I've learned so much from her that I just never thought that I would do. And she allows me to be more, to be, you know, as creative as I want to be when it comes to hosting and also when it comes to writing as well. And I feel like I've had like a crash course in journalism mm -hmm. um, as a whole, you know, when yeah. it comes to, you know, learning under her, I just feel like she's just, she's like my mentor and my teacher. And yeah. I just appreciate her so much. Like seriously, like I do. She's and she, amazing. and she really believes in me and it's just like, Oh man, like, thanks. <laughs> yeah. That's the best. Yes, it is. So how would you say you feel about the state of wrestling now? And what do you think is really good about it? And what could be improved? Sure. Um, I, I think we're in a revolutionary space in terms of pro wrestling right now. Um, I have felt this since 2016. Um, 2016, when we started seeing, obviously 2014, we saw the WWE Network. Um, but by 2016, we started seeing, you know, Cody had left. Cody and the Bucks are starting to, to really do some things. New Japan is now becoming available to us in the States with NJPW World. Streaming happening so that now, you know, you can watch wrestling pretty much anywhere in the world, uh, which is incredible. And then we get to 2019 where, you know, WWE goes on to Fox, which is just insane. AEW starts its own thing. NWA has its own show. It's like the new boom of pro wrestling, you know? And so we had the pandemic era, era, and now we're in this space where wrestling is really, really booming. So in terms of what I think is really good, um, I think it's a good thing when there are lots of places for people to work. Um, you know, I never thought it was good for there to only be one main show in town. Um, it's almost like if you had only one genre of music, right? Like, the, the world yeah. is so creative that we need many different expressions to be able to get that creativity out. And so that's what I think is great about wrestling is that there are a lot of places to apply your craft right now. You know, it's not just AEW or WWE. You have tons of amazing indie organizations. You've got, of course, what's happening with Impact and the NWA and so many other spaces. And even, wow, wow, being on CBS, like, mind-blowing right you know so it's all of these things that are happening i love 
uh, the fact that Triple H is now head of creative in WWE. Um, and the fact that people are now getting excited about WWE again. It has literally been over 20 years since people have been excited about WWE. That's happening now. That means really, really good things. Um, I love what's happening in New Japan. I love, I love all of this. Um, things that I think that can be improved. Um, I think it's always going to, oh, oh, well, yeah, let's start here. I think it's always been a challenging space for the African-American wrestler. I think the African-American in pro wrestling is still experiencing a bit of a renaissance. Like we have more African-American wrestlers, male and female now than we've ever had in the history of the business, which right. is a great thing. The challenge with that is how do we get some of these companies to utilize this talent well? Um, it seemed like certainly there was a period in WWE where, man, this was a great place for African-American wrestlers to be. Uh, then it kind of hit a bit of a lull. Um, I think the jury's going to still be out once now Triple H gets the opportunity to do some things with that. Um, but I think the way that that gets fixed in WWE and in AEW is to get people who look like us into those creative rooms. Right. Um, you know, I, I literally heard an interview today um, from Jasmine Guy when she was talking about a different world. She talked about the difference between season one and season two. And she credited the difference between season one and season two uh, being Debbie Allen coming on board and Debbie Allen telling the writers, hey, you can't think you just write something. And because a black person says it, that it makes it authentic to being black. No, you mm -hmm. have to go visit an HBCU. You have to go do your research. You have to go and be authentic. So I don't think that these organizations have representation that is authentic, that could reflect how we behave, how we do things, what we say. It's more than just having us rap, right? We are way more than that. So I think having someone that looks like us in the writing room, in the creative room, and then in the executive spaces, I think those things are super important and will help present a more balanced picture uh, of what pro wrestling should look like because wrestling has always been a microcosm of the larger world. And so if the larger world isn't fully represented in pro wrestling, then we need to fix and adjust some things. And so that would be uh, one of the things that I think we, we can adjust and fix. Definitely. I 100% agree with all of that. And not even and not even just in the commentary space. I also feel and even in the I mean, not even just in the creative space mm -hmm. um, or even from the athletic point. Right. I also feel like in commentary, there needs to be more diversity as well. I totally agree. Because it's just and also even when it when it comes to documentaries, I can't tell you how many wrestling documentaries I've seen where they'll interview people who are who have written articles or people who are hosts and everything it's like they'll sprinkle some mm -hmm. black people in there but mm -hmm. the majority of the people are always vanilla and it's yes. just like or they're male and it's just yeah. like y'all yeah. do know that we also watch this right and right. That we've been watching it for a long time and collecting knowledge on it too so yeah. if we've been collecting knowledge on this and if we host shows and if we do all these things and host podcasts and write articles about it how come you're not asking us to be on dark side of the ring how right. come you're not asking us to be on you know this is awesome or whatever type of documentary you've got going on mm -hmm. like put us there how come you're not putting more women on commentary how come you don't have yes. more women on your pre-shows yes like that aren't just moderating the conversation for the men to offer right. their knowledge like right. there needs to be you know from a knowledge perspective from an analytical perspective there needs to be more um people of color but definitely more black people as well because mm -hmm. we are a part of the culture and we move the needle in wrestling just as much as anybody else does yeah. um and we're not just athletes we're intellectuals and yes our intellectual property has value in wrestling just as much as our athletic property does and I that's totally something agree. that i want to see more of um from my own perspective as well yeah. um especially as i'm moving through um mm -hmm. my own and having my own journey because i've tweeted before like if i can be a commentator you know in a major mainstream promotion i mm -hmm. want to do that 
Yes. Like, and if I'm the first black one, then so mm-hmm. be it. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I want. Like, if I can do that, then that'll be great. And eat, yeah. and more than just us doing backstage stuff, too, because I love Kayla Braxton. She's yes. from Alabama, just like me. And wow. she's a black woman. Yeah. And I love everything that she does. But at the same time, we're more than just, you know, backstage interviewers, too. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. put us at the table. Put me next to Corey Graves so I can, you know, nitpick with him a little bit. Yeah. Like, let me do that. <laughs> no, no, I I totally agree, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about you know what TK has done and what a few other people have done in terms of first of all bringing uh, those of us who are African American um, involved in the wrestling industry together, um, so that we're not silos, so that we know that we are existing and we know what we are doing, and so that we can begin to galvanize and remind and inform people that we are here that we do have something to say and that we have uh, an uh, incredible opinions and incredible perspectives that add something to the the conversation. And that's one of the reasons why, again, I'm excited about Triple H being in this space because he has opened up so many doors for so many people to be able to walk through and and do some pretty cool things. Like I'm with you. I, I do think it's kind of tragic that, you know, uh, Renee Paquette, was the only female commentator in WWE. And that didn't last long. And they gave her a hard time, um, right. you know, which I think is terrible. Beth Phoenix was amazing in NXT. She I was. really, and she was just fantastic, you know. But I, I think it's unfortunate that, and we've not had any female commentators in AEW. You know, I, I think we, we have to get to this point where. We recognize, let me just get, okay, I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, We have to get to the point where we recognize that women are more than eye candy in pro wrestling. Um, And I think that women have been limited to only being eye candy for so long that people forget what they bring to the table. And I think it's just, it is wrong that women are not given more opportunities at the table uh, to do incredible. I mean, right now we've got a woman as the CEO of WWE. So it seems to make sense that we should have more female voices in more prominent spaces right now um, across all desks in WWE and and not just in WWE, but everywhere else. So I think we've got to be able to make room for that. And so, you know, the next thing then becomes us continuing to create content and continuing to put it out there so that they can ultimately find us. And I believe they will. And uh, as they do, I think we'll see some amazing things happen because I think quite frankly, we all need to be in those spaces because I don't know that we're currently represented well. Right. So, and when it comes to that work, they'll see my work and they'll know where to find me. There it is. You know where I'm at. There it is. (laughs) And that's why we we keep putting it out there. We keep doing things. Uh, let me encourage people, and I'm saying this for me and everybody that's watching. You know, sometimes we're afraid to put our stuff out there because we're just, you know, sometimes I don't like promoting myself. I'll tell you that I hate it. But they're not going to find you unless you put yourself out there. So you have to put yourself out there. You have to get involved with things um, so that people are aware. And when you put it out there, no matter what the level of resource you have, make it the absolute best quality you can. Um, Because you don't want them to be distracted by saying, oh, well, they don't have that. No, you're going to get this work. And I'm going to do the absolute best I can to make sure you get it. And I'm going to do what I got to do to improve the presentation of it. But you're going to get it. And uh, it's going to be undeniable. Exactly. Yeah. So what would you say the future holds for you, Gerard? <laughs> the future for me, uh, I think, finds me in WWE in, at the commentary booth. Um, I, I really do. It, it is really one of my life goals, and I'm very, very focused on it. Um, I just feel like what I have to offer is something that belongs in those spaces. And so I think it would be incredible to have happen. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm enjoying what I am doing right now uh, in these independent spaces. I think it's amazing. I love that. And I, I honestly hope that I'll be able to do them both, you know, where I can do WB because I mean, we don't have shows every night. 
So, I mean, it would be kind of cool to be able to do that. But for me, laser focused on being in the commentary booth on Raw, SmackDown, Mania, that is a major focus. Yeah. Definitely. And I absolutely respect that. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm focused on too. But I feel like, yeah. I feel like even though I'm new, mm-hmm. I feel like my focus is about like in 10 different places creatively. And I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a, it, it, it just weirds me out sometimes. It's like yeah. I'm hosting, I'm commentating, I'm writing. Sure. And it's just like, Jesus Christ, where am yeah. I? Gonna- <laughs> but, but here's the thing. There's <laughs> space to do it all. And I think yeah. you have to give yourself freedom to do that. Like, for instance, uh, being a part of WWE doesn't mean that I'm going to stop doing the other things that I'm going to be doing. No, I can do that, too. You know, so it it is absolutely possible. And, you know, you never know where the break will come from. So I would say, by all means, do the thing that it is that you're desiring to do. I'm still doing radio. I'm still hosting things. I'm still involved in a lot of other things. Um, but for me, yeah, right now, the main goal is definitely getting to WWE uh, in doing commentary. And I'm still going to be doing a bunch of other things as well. But yeah, don't don't make don't let anybody make you feel like you can't focus on a bunch of things where, where much is given, much is required. So, you know, you can get it all done. You absolutely can get it all done. Yeah, that's what I'm learning right now. Yeah. Well, Gerard, thank you so much for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I've thank learned you. so much. So would you please tell everybody where they can find you and follow you on your socials and tell everybody what you've got going on? Absolutely. You can find me at Bonnerfied on all the socials, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I am there. Uh, you can check me out on commentary for Southern Honor Wrestling. We are on IWTV. Our latest show was about a week or so ago. So that show should pop up on IWTV any day now so definitely check it out and you can get a subscription there uh, with five days for free if you use the promo code SHW so go ahead and do that if you're not already part of IWTV Uh, also doing commentary work for Battle Slam with my man Suge D and uh, Battle Slam you can check out all of our stuff on Fight TV some big announcements coming about Battle Slam in the next few days including how you'll be able to check out that match with Lil Scrappy and Baron Black so that should be amazing This Sunday, I'll be debuting with a brand new promotion called Championship District Wrestling here out of Atlanta. Uh, A guy by the name of the Diamond Sheik just kind of went viral with a video he did with Rick Ross. Yeah, so Diamond Sheik will be a part of this. I don't know if Rick Ross is going to show up, but uh, (laughs) yeah, Championship District Wrestling will be premiering that this Sunday. And uh, if you're not able to make it in Atlanta, I do believe it's going to be streaming on the YouTube channel for Championship District Wrestling. Um, Gosh, what else? Uh, Bonnerfied again. Check me there. And uh, oh, I don't I usually don't talk about this on on the wrestling podcast, but I do have a daily radio show uh, called the Bonnerfied Experience on SoFlo Radio. You can check it out at SoFloRadio.com. Or you can check it out on the Alexa app, uh, iHeartRadio, all those spaces. Show airs from 3 to 7 p.m. Central, Monday to Friday. So it's a daily show uh, with all sorts of really, really cool things that are happening there. So all that cool stuff. And you can get merch at uh, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Bonnerfied. Brand new shirt there called Bet On You. It's your opportunity to fully invest in your God-given talents and put all your chips on you. So check it out. Pro Wrestling. All right, so I want to thank Gerard Barner for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. We had such a good time, if you could tell, you know, talking to each other and just vibing out and talking about everything he's interested in from music to radio to wrestling as a whole. So I'm just really happy to talk to him and I wish nothing but continued success for him in his career. And of course, you know, please check him out wherever, basically everywhere he said you can find him because he's got a lot of great stuff going on. So, of course, as usual, you can follow me, your girl, Stephanie Hardy, on Instagram and Twitter at Queen Steph Hardy. And, of course, you can find um, the Hardy Wrestling Podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts as Anchor, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, you know, anywhere you get podcasts. You can find it. And of course, I want you to, to like, share, and subscribe any videos and clips that I post. Um, and also subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Hardy Wrestling Podcast. So if you search 
if you go on YouTube, search The Hardy Wrestling Podcast, because if you type in just Hardy Wrestling Podcast, you'll get Jeff and you'll get Matt, but you won't get me until like a little bit later. But keep looking until you find the um, purple logo that has HWP in the middle of a ring. And basically, that's me. So please check my stuff out. Um, You can also follow my Facebook page, um, The Hardy Wrestling Podcast as well. And just continue to support the show and follow me on, follow the podcast on Twitter at Hardy WrestlePod. And also follow it on Instagram at Hardy Wrestling Podcast. So... This weekend, I might release another episode because there was a lot of stuff that happened in wrestling that I do want to talk about um, separate of this episode. So um, probably by at least Saturday or maybe Sunday, a newer episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast will be out. um, And then I'll be able to talk about what I liked in wrestling this week and how we're going to navigate these changing waters together and then also i'm going to talk about a couple of things that i didn't like that i heard about in wrestling this week too so we're gonna get into it all but until next time this is the hardy wrestling podcast with your girl stephanie hardy and of course the theme song steph's theme was performed by josiah williams aka mr wrestle and flow until next time bye y'all